Well, let's turn in our Bibles this morning to the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. I hope I don't need to tell you what page number we are looking for. We're going to read in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. And although this is rather a long reading, and I'm jealous of the time I have this morning, uh, since there is a promise given in Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 of a special blessing to the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, I'm somewhat tempted just to spend the whole morning hour reading the words of this prophecy. And lest you be deprived of that blessing, I want to invite you to read with me those parts which uh, you may, if you have a modern translation, find set off, for example, in chapter 4, verse 8, and chapter 4, verse 11, and chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, and although it's not set off, chapter 5, verse 12. And so we come to these passages. Let's read them together and uh, catch something of the magnificence of these glorious words. After this, says John, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and seated on the thrones were twenty-four elders, clothed in white garments, with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are You, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For You created all things, and by Your will they existed and were created. Then. I saw in the right hand of Him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly, because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went 
and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying together, to Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. I became a Christian shortly before my 15th birthday, and a few months later on I took my pocket money, it was two shillings and sixpence in the early 1960s, enough to buy a rather poor golf ball, but as a devotee of that royal and ancient sport, but captured for Jesus Christ, I decided I should spend my pocket money this Saturday on something entirely different. I walked into the town in which I lived, went into a Christian bookshop, and bought the relatively recently released translation or paraphrase of the book of Revelation by the great English paraphraser J. B. Phillips. It was a cold and wet day, nothing unusual about that, you might think, in Scotland. We didn't have central heating in our house, but in my bedroom I had a very primitive electric fire with many bars. I turned it on that Saturday afternoon and spent the afternoon absolutely engrossed in the book of Revelation. I suppose I was naive enough not to see its problems, and I saw only its open secrets. The great message of the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ conquers, and I will conquer in Jesus Christ. And from that time for many years in those early days of my Christian life, I turned to these two chapters that we have read together every single Lord's Day morning to prepare my heart for the public worship of God. I'm sure I didn't really understand everything that I was reading or everything that I was doing, but I suppose I had a basic instinct that this was probably the supreme description, illustration, and portrayal of true worship, of the church's true worship anywhere to be found in heaven. As the Father has given to His Son, as John tells us in Revelation chapter 1, as the Father has given to His Son an apocalypse, an unveiling of Himself and His significance and His work and His present and future ministry in order to share that unveiling with the Apostle John and with the church in every age. 
And in, as you remember, chapters 3 and 4, having encountered the risen and glorious Christ, the Alpha and the Omega, the Apostle John sees Jesus Christ present among the churches, standing in a sense as the critic, but also the curator of the church of God in Jesus Christ. And then, as this section of Revelation begins to open up, having seen the church on earth from Christ's point of view, the Apostle John is invited to see the church in glory from the divine point of view. And he finds this door flown open into heaven and finds himself caught up, as he says, in the Spirit. He was in the Spirit, he says at the beginning of the book of Revelation, on the Lord's day. And in some senses, what we see in these chapters in the book of Revelation is simply a pictorial representation of what happens to Christian believers and to our congregations, our assemblies of the Lord, when on the Lord's day we are in the Spirit and a door is opened into heaven, and there we have access to the praise and worship of our glorious God. I sometimes think as I read Isaiah chapter 6 that if you could have got hold of Isaiah staggering down from the Temple Mount on that day and said to him, you're looking a little shaken, Isaiah. What on earth happened in the temple? I think he might have said, you know, I really believe I've been to the temple for the very first time in my life and begun to understand what it is that we do when we engage there in the worship of the God of all the earth. And in a similar sense, we might say that the Apostle John, in this open door he has into heaven, is seeing certainly in a way he could never have seen before apart from the apocalypse of the Lord Jesus to him what it really means, if I can put it this way, for the people of God to assemble as the church and to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Indeed, you remember how the author of the letter to the Hebrews indicates in Hebrews chapter 12 that this is not simply a description of the worship of the church assembled at the throne of God in glory, but this is the worship in which all of the people of God share when they do not forsake the assembling of themselves together. You recall how he puts it in Hebrews chapter 12. He says, we have not come to the mountain and to the thunder and the lightning, Hebrews 12 verse 18, of Sinai, but we have come, he says, to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn, which are enrolled in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And it seems to me there can be few things more important for the church of Jesus Christ in our own age, in the midst of all the discussions that take place about the nature and character of worship, than that we should understand that this is the true nature and the true character of godly worship that by the Spirit of God, we who are in Christ on earth have access to the worship that is participated in by saints and angels, cherubim and seraphim, and a myriad host of those who are glorified in Jesus Christ, and that every Lord's day we enter into the antechamber of heaven's glory. And whether they understood it or not, our fathers, 
when they used to sing so cheerfully about heaven coming down and glory filling their souls, understood a measure of this experience, perhaps without understanding that what really happens in worship is not simply that heaven comes down and glory fills our souls, but we by the Spirit are invited into these heavenly realms where glory fills everything. And so, I want, as we have time this morning, to notice essentially two things that we find here in this graphic picture of heaven's worship in which we upon the earth participate. The first, obviously, is the focus of the church's worship, and the second, equally obviously, is the character of the church's worship. What is the focus of the church's worship? One of the great keys to interpreting the book of Revelation is to understand that it, in many ways, is like a tapestry. You know, when you see those art programs on television with the art expert interpreting the canvas or the tapestry, how the camera will move round different parts of the picture and explain the glorious central message of this work of art by showing you how the details are all arranged in such a way as to communicate a single magnificent message. And of course, there is a single magnificent message. But just as in those programs, the camera angles will change, and, and one of the things that we always look for is when the camera pauses and lingers on something to tell us visually this is of immense significance. And so, in the book of Revelation, where there's much action, much dynamism, one of the things to look for is the camera angles and the places where the camera pauses as though the Spirit were saying, now fix your gaze upon this. And here in this vivid picture of heaven's worship, you notice where the focus of the camera lies, the epicenter of worship is the triune God, the Father who is seated on the throne, what the Te Deum Laudamus describes as the Father of an infinite majesty. And you notice how marvelously He is described, identified in the first instance as the covenant Lord around His throne and echo, a visual echo of the Noahic covenant in the emerald-like rainbow that surrounds His glory, the thunder and lightnings that come from His throne that are so reminiscent of His engaging with Moses in the Mosaic covenant. This is the Ancient of Days who has covenanted Himself to His people and said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And surrounded as He is by the twenty-four elders who perhaps represent the patriarchs of the old and the apostles of the new, surrounded by the entire community of the redeemed in every single age. And the manifestation of His glory evokes waves of praise that succeed one another and increase in their volume and increase in their marvelous focus. For what is the Father of an infinite majesty worshipped? Well, He is worshipped, first of all, because He is we worship You, our Lord and God, holy in Your glory, verse 8, because You were and You are and You are to come. Worship for His absolute independence. Worship for the perfections of His holiness. Worship just because He is God and is so gloriously different from ourselves. 
and worship because He who is altogether sufficient from all eternity, for all eternity, utterly sufficient for Himself in His own splendid eternal glory, has been kind and wise and brought into being a marvelous creation. Verse 11, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Have you not thought since you were a child this thought of a child that's more profound than you can ever fathom? I might never have existed. This world might never have existed. God has need neither of me nor of this world, but for His glory He has created the cosmos, and in His kindness He has created me, and therefore I am bound to worship and adore Him and give Him glory and honor and express the majesty of His power. And he is worshipped supremely, says John, as he observes this great scene and then begins to be drawn in to participate in it. He is worshipped supremely because he sits on the throne of his glory, at the center of the cosmos, at the center of heaven's worship. There is a throne that is occupied by God. And you notice as this narrative unfolds, we are told not only for what the Father is worshipped as He's seated on the throne, but by whom the Father is worshipped, by the whole family of God in heaven, joined by these representatives of the whole family of God in redemptive history. God is worshipped wonderfully by His people. And there are praise leaders in this worship. Or I suppose more accurately, there are deputy praise leaders in this worship, in these marvelous creatures who are described in chapter 4, verse 6 and following. Around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. See how our conductor yesterday evening needed eyes in front and behind to lead the people and to lead his choristers in praise and honor and worship of God. They see everywhere Isn't it fascinating to watch a conductor to see how his eyes are constantly darting to and fro, seeking, as it were, to bring into one glorious harmony all the diverse parts of the music, the symphony that is being played. And here there are deputy choir leaders, these strange and marvelous creatures who are, we might say, to the living Creator God, akin to what our domestic pets are to us. They are our friends. Yes, a dog was never meant to be a man's best friend, but what a glorious thing it is to be surrounded by all the magnificent creatures of creation as as in the original creation Adam named them and led them in worship and in praise, and hear these deputy choir leaders, strange creatures beyond our imagination, and yet representative, if I can put it this way, of the home life of the Father into which we are invited by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are told that these four living creatures, verse 8, with six wings, so reminiscent of those creatures in Isaiah chapter 6. They never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Now, isn't this interesting? 
that if we read Isaiah chapter 6 entirely on its own, almost everybody draws the conclusion that there are two of these creatures who antiphonally say to each other, to one another, holy, holy, holy. But on top of that Old Testament revelation and vision that Isaiah sees is the apocalypse given to John, helping us to see that there is yet more to it than that, and that the praise that surrounds the glory of God is not antiphonal sound, but what they call nowadays surround sound, quadraphonic sound a quadrantiphonal, a round, as one says to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, and the other responds, holy, 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 and yet another responds, holy, 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 another responds, holy, 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 as they sing so magnificently in harmony the praises of the God who sits upon the throne. And so the focus of the church's worship is on the sovereignty of the Creator God who is worshipped simply because He is the Father of an infinite majesty who is seated on the throne. But yes, as John sees, the worship of heaven is also focused on the Son who is in the center of the throne. Says John, I saw on the right hand of Him who was seated on the throne a scroll chapter 5, verse 1, and no one was found worthy to take the scroll and to break its seals and to open it. And he saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing, the lamb who stands at the front of the throne, the lamb who provides the access gate to the throne the Lamb who is the Lion of the tribe of Judah who is conquered, the Lion of the tribe of Judah who is conquered by being the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And in these two marvelous pictures of our Lord Jesus Christ, John sees both the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, the long-awaited day when Abraham's promise to his son God Himself will provide a lamb for the sacrifice, is married to the great promise that the Lion of the tribe of Judah will conquer for and deliver His people. And you notice that the place in which the Lamb is located in chapter 5 underlines for us that He is the one who has made our salvation actual. Verse 9, you were slain by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. But He's not only represented as the one who makes salvation actual, He's represented in verse 10 as the one who makes our worship possible. You have made them, O Lamb, you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And it's this, and this is one of the most interesting and dramatic points in the whole of the Bible. It's this that turns the words that are said in heaven to a song that is sung in heaven. They, verse 9, sang a new song. But you notice that John sees something else. Between the throne and the four living creatures, 5 verse 6, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth, or what our hymn writers of old called the sevenfold spirit of God. And you see the picture of the vision the Father who is seated on the throne, the Son who gives us access to the throne, the Spirit who flows to us from the throne 
through the Son to bring us in the Spirit, as John says in chapter 4, verse 2, who brings us in the Spirit to go through the open door into heaven. And there with angels and archangels and myriads of the redeemed in every age to cast our crowns before our Lord Jesus Christ and crown Him Lord of all. Actually, this is a pictorial representation of the propositional teaching that Paul gives us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18, isn't it? We have access to the Father through the blood of Christ and by the energy of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes to us from the space in which the Father and the Son occupy the throne room. He comes to us in such a way that He illumines that space, and He comes to us in such a way that by God's grace there is a sense in which He brings us near to have communion through Him with the Lamb who is the Lion, and through the Lamb who is the Lion with the one who is seated on the throne, the Father of an infinite majesty. Let me pause just to try and teach you a little theology here, as though this were not theology. That's a terrible thing to say. The Christian church in every age has understood that when God is engaged in any activity beyond Himself, he is always wholly engaged in that activity. The fathers used to speak, of course, in Latin about the opera ad extra, trinitatis, the external works of the Trinity. And they said those opera, those works, indivisa sunt, they are indivisible. That is to say, in every activity of God in creation, in providence, in redemption, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are always engaged, and therefore the corresponding demand that's placed upon us in our worship, that when we worship God, we worship Him in His triune majesty, Father and Son and Holy Spirit but they also spoke about what they called the appropriations of the Trinity, in which each person of the Trinity, through mutual engagement with one another, through the mutuality and the power and the exercise of all divine attributes within the eternal being of God, you need to understand that if you're going to know God that God needs nothing but His own Trinitarian being for all of His attributes to be in satisfying exercise from all eternity, in all eternity, and to all eternity. And what the gospel of Jesus Christ brings us into is an understanding that the triune God has engaged in our salvation that the triune God who is in Himself infinite and perfect blessedness, in which all of His eternal attributes are in mutual engagement and fellowship and expression, and all of His being is, in a sense, a mutual triune self-giving in an infinite wonder of splendid majesty but what it means for us to come and worship is to be able to come, as those same fathers used to say, to understand that since the Father is the Creator, we come to Him as creatures and we praise Him. Yes, we recognize the Son has shared in that creation, the Spirit has been the executive of that creation, but since it seems the Father has planned this creation and planned our salvation, yes, always in concert with the other two persons of the Trinity, there is a sense in which we come to Him and we have fellowship with Him in a very distinctive way as the Almighty Creator. 
And since it is true that the Son died on the cross for us, and though the Father and the Spirit were mutually engaged in that activity on the cross, God the Father so loved the world that He gave His only Son. The Father delivered up His Son for us all. The Son gave Himself, Hebrew says, in the power and energy of the eternal Spirit. But neither the Father nor the Spirit died for us on the cross. And so we have, in the unity of God's triune being, a, a kind of distinct fellowship with and worship of our Lord Jesus Christ because He has died for us. And although the Father has planned our salvation, and the Son has died for our salvation, it's the Spirit who brings that salvation to us. And so, we have what the New Testament calls a special communion, fellowship, share in the Holy Spirit as the one who has brought the riches of God's fatherly plan and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ down into our heart so that as we worship Him, as we admire Him, we admire Him because He is this triune God, and because this triune God and all the riches of His triunity has in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit according to the sovereign plan of the Father written in the scroll that is sealed with seven seals, this God has invited us to go through the door that is open into the worship of heaven and join those who cast their crowns before Him and to crown Him Lord of all. So much for the focus of our worship. Let me take a few minutes to speak about what this passage teaches us about the character of our worship. What is the goal of our worship? The goal of our worship is to admire. The goal of our worship is so through the Word, by the Spirit leading us to the Son as the Son unveils the Father of infinite majesty to stand back and say, Oh, That will be your first word in glory. Oh, the ineffable majesty of God to feel His glory. You know, as well taught, well schooled, renewing your mind, Christians, that the Old Testament word for glory is the word that expresses the idea of your worth measured in your weight. I don't mean your personal weight, I mean the weight of your possessions. And God is of an infinite weight. God, as the Westminster Confession says, is most pure Spirit who weighs in His glory far more than the weight of the entire universe that He has created. It is but a, a reflection for puny creatures like ourselves to sense the majesty and glory of this God. And you see what happens when God unveils His glory? What do these creatures do? What do the saints in glory do? What, what are we called to do? Well, there is an instinct here. Verse 9 of chapter 4, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down and worship Him. They fall down. You know, if you belong to the kind of tradition to which I belong, you are encouraged in worship to stand upright. Keep your hands on your hymn book. And if you're going to tap your toes, do it under the pew in front of you. But you see, if I may put it this way, 
in this day when we who are all spiritually deaf have our ears unstopped, and we who are all spiritually blind have our eyes opened, then not only in mind and inwardly in spirit, but with hands holding golden crowns, we will cast our crowns before the Lord. Some of you have seen the Ligonier uh, interpretation that Chuck has done, and whereas in almost all other interpretation, at least it used to be this way, the interpreter was in a small bit of the screen away off at the side. But here the hand actions, the body movements are all center stage in the Ligonier videos, at least the ones I've seen, and so it is here. As we cast our crowns before Him and worship and adore Him. What's, what, is, what is the thing that you are most likely to be struck by in heaven? It's first of all that you have a crown, and then it's second that you can constantly cast that crown before the Lord in worship and adoration. But do you notice, and this is, I think, a very significant thing in the New Testament and certainly here in Revelation chapter 5, if the goal of worship is to admire Him in all of His majesty and to cast our crowns before Him and crown Him Lord of all, then notice that in this portrayal of worship, all worship flows from Christ's leadership and through Christ's mediation. Isn't it interesting that John sees the lion lamb standing right at the front of the throne of God, and from him the Spirit of God flowing to all those who are present in heaven's glory, as though to say, your worship of the one who is seated upon the throne needs first of all to be conducted by the one who stands at the front of the throne. And it always needs to come through by the Spirit, through the Son, to the one who is seated on the throne. Because you see, as we've noticed already, He is not only the mediator of our reconciliation, he is the mediator of our adoration in worship. Indeed, the letter to the Hebrews that in so many ways gives us a kind of theological interpretation of what this worship scene means tells us in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 2 that in that heavenly sanctuary we have Jesus Christ as our liturgos, as our worship leader. That's why I said these amazing creatures are really deputy worship leaders. Jesus Christ is the worship leader of heaven's glory, ascended in our humanity, bringing all of us by His grace before the throne of His Father and saying, as you remember Hebrews 2 cites the words of Isaiah and puts them into the lips of our Lord Jesus, saying, Father, here I am, and the children you have given me gathers us into His presence, leads us in our praises. You notice He is the one who makes possible intercession for us. Chapter 5, verse 9, you made us priests to our God. And he is the one who as we find in several places in the New Testament Scriptures, in our worship is the one who really preaches the Word of God into our hearts. That's why the dichotomy between worship and preaching is so unbiblical, because the Jesus who leads us in our praises is the same Jesus whose voice is heard by His sheep in the ministry of the Word, causing us, as the Scriptures are open to us, causing us to say, oh, and ah, He knows me. He speaks to me. He cares for me. 
My dear friend, if you've never experienced that either, you have never heard preaching in the power of the Spirit, or you are not yet a Christian believer. It must be one or the other, because when the Word of God is preached in the power of the Spirit of God, Jesus Christ Himself is the preacher of His Word. Remember how, again, in a passage that in some senses helps us to understand this, in Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, Christ made peace by the blood of His cross, and now Christ comes and preaches peace into our hearts. Have you never experienced your heart burning within you as He walks with you through the service, through the ministry of the Word? And opens his glory in the Scriptures to you. And so, John sees a door open into heaven. He learns what it is that we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. That is, by the Holy Spirit, through the mediation of the one who is the truth. The Father seeks such to worship Him. Apparently, there were occasions in temple worship when something of this was experienced by the people of God. For example, in Psalm 133, that is one of those great pilgrimage psalms in the Psalter. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil the anointing oil, the symbol of the blessed Holy Spirit. It's like the precious oil of the Spirit on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron. You see the symbolism? The Father anointing His Aaron, our great high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ, with the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit so that that might flow down on the collar of His robes, cover, as it were, those stones and that breastplate on which were emblazoned the names of all the children of Israel. When that happens in worship, what is it like, the psalmist says? And he uses geographical rather than liturgical imagery to describe it. He says, it's like the dew of Hermon up there in the highlands, snow-capped Hermon. It's like the dew of Hermon falling on Mount Zion. You see what he's saying? He's saying it's like a visitation from another world, or it's like us visiting another world, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing. That's why the Apostle Paul, who does not seem to believe that the church does its evangelism in its church services, in its worship, that's one of the dreadful mistakes of the late 20th century that keeps us in the ghetto in which we turn our worship services into entertainment in order to reach the lost instead of understanding that we worship God together according to His Word as His community, and then the power of the Holy Spirit takes us out and brings others to us in our fellowship together. But it does happen, says the Apostle Paul, even in those days when they met in homes and by rivers, that perhaps a stranger, an outsider will come in, And when the Word of God is spoken and the secrets of his or her heart are unveiled, he or she will bow down and say, surely God is in the midst of you. That's actually what we need most of all. We need the sense of the weight of God's glory in our worship. And then, men and women will be brought to worship with us.
colleague of mine led a tour of the seven cities of Revelation chapter 2 and 3 last year, and I asked him if he had gone to Patmos. He said, well, I asked the tour organizer about going to Patmos. He said, it'll take you a day to go. It'll take you a day to get back. And when you get there, you'll see nothing. And I said to him with as much a smile as I could muster, tell that one to the Apostle John. <laughs> but you see, the sad truth of the matter is that people can come among us, go from us, and see nothing. But when God is worshipped in the energy of the Spirit, through the mediation of the Son, and we bow before the Father of an infinite majesty in worship. Then, Isaiah-like, we stagger from the temple mound and say, I've been to church, and I've worshiped God. My dear brothers and sisters, there are to me no more magical words in the English language, apart from the blessed names of the Trinity, than the words, let us worship God. I trust by God's grace that that is the high privilege of all of our lives. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come in the strong name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the energy and power and grace of the Holy Spirit. Teach us, we pray, to exclaim with the Apostle John that by the Spirit our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And make us, we pray, Your true worshipers, that we may then be Your faithful witnesses. We ask it for Jesus' sake.